And now I'm going to ask HSE Director General Tony O'Brien to, fish, to officially open the conference. I'm not going to be there, Chair. Bio and um, I think from people because smart bio and your but I'm going to say a few words before you get up. You don't get away that easy. Um, Tony will be very familiar to all of you and he has a long history in health services and I was thinking about this last night and I think we first came to talk together when I worked in the Department of Health and Health Promotion and he worked in Tony worked in the Irish Family Planning Association. So you two decades ago. And um, more recently Tony will be known for his role in cancer screening and the cancer control program before taking up the leadership of the special delivery unit under Minister James Riley. Uh, in 2012 he was anointed as the chosen one to be uh, Minister Riley's health service executive director general. And um, I think since then uh, Tony has proven his leadership skills in his own right. I think we're seeing greater coherency at very senior levels across the health system. And I think in particular, the emphasis in the last 18 months on quality and caring uh, is coming from having Tony O'Brien at the top of the HSE. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say about him there. In particular, you could explain, because the press query yesterday couldn't explain why there was only 8.9 million hours provided last year when there was 10.3 million hours in the service time. Okay, plenty of mine. And this is a very uh, have to go to the beach. Thank you for the wonder if you don't stay there. Um, we went to the water. So, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great privilege uh, to be here this morning at this inaugural conference. And I know that there's a good cross section of people from different sectors, and this really does provide an opportunity to take stock on where we are in relation to all of I think it's very timely. It's expected in the next few weeks that a national conversation will be commenced around what we really want from our health and social care services in Ireland with the publication of the white paper or consultation paper from UHI. I think it really is timely that we do have a national conversation that defines what our aspirations are for the type of public care service we require in Ireland for decades to come. And I hope that this conference can begin that one part of that conversation which can be continued throughout that consultation process. I've often made reference to the National Health Service in the UK, to some extent because I was born in an American hospital. It was on the day that I was anointed as Sarah Fitzgerald. It was also the opening day of the London 2012 Olympics. And any of you who recall watching the Living Ceremony will recall that there was a whole segment of the Living Ceremony which was all about what makes British people proud to be British in their own terms. The daughter to the NHS and the great woman's so popular. And this, while the NHS, like our own health system, has many challenges, weaknesses, and even failures, there is something about the culture and the underpinning morality around what the NHS is intended to be that makes it a central part of how people in Britain define themselves and their society. And I hope that through a really good conversation about what we want from our health care system. We can, in the years ahead, come to a point where we can say the way we provide health and social care and other is also part of how we define ourselves in a way that clearly isn't now. So I would encourage everyone to take part in that conversation when it passes. So the Health Services Directorate, which I am privileged to lead, was established last July. And within that directorate, there is a social care division under the leadership of Pat Healy, the National Director which now supports the planning, organisation and safe delivery of care for older persons and for people with disabilities to improve standards. And both care groups have a common objective of supporting and assisting people to live at home or in their own community and to promote lifestyle choice for our clients and users. And along with the development of the commissioning framework, which is part of the purpose to provide a split that will be part of the future of our provision. It provides opportunities for joint working and learning as we move away from the traditional and often institutional based service to a more person centered model. And thus it can be said that those two care groups 
have a natural home general and social care. The, the dry force more care at home and closer to home is also central to the work of our clinical programs and to our primary care vision as we seek to move care out of institutional settings and out of possible settings. The place of work is essentially more convenient, more appropriate, more sustainable, and more cost effective in the way of providing the services. And over the past decade, Ireland has achieved an unprecedented improvement in life expectancy. And life expectancy in Ireland has increased by a full four years since the year 2000 and has been consistently higher than the EU average throughout the last decade. That's something that we should, we should celebrate. Much of this increase is due to significant reductions in the major causes of death, such as circulatory system disease. And the overall mortality rate of disease has reduced now by 22%. So Ireland is now beginning to catch up with other European countries in terms of population aging. Indeed, the population of over age 65 years and over has been increasing at a faster rate than that of our aging age. And this achievement in aging should be welcomed and celebrated and be viewed as a positive the demographic human and cultural achievement for Ireland, not as it is often characterized as a demographic finding disorder, but a phrase that I absolutely deprecate and I have wish never to hear. The numbers of people in this age group over 65 is expected to more than double in the coming decades, with the greatest proportional increase in the 85 plus age group. But I'm also encouraged by evidence that levels of disability amongst the oldest of the old are gradually falling. If such a demographic trend it does require us as health service providers, policymakers, care professionals, and everyone involved in this discussion to orient our services to meet the needs of this population group and their families, then care at home must absolutely be essential to everything we do that's planned for that. And so, for services for older people, this commitment to care at home has been demonstrated in the HSC National Service Plan. And, and the operational plan for the social care division for this year. And that plan emphasizes providing comprehensive home care and community support to maintain all the people in their own homes and communities for as long as possible. And that was the common goal for everyone here. And to achieve the objectives of the division, services need to be provided through a person-centered model and in a collaborative way with shared responsibility between the person, their families, and carers. And obviously the multiplicity of agencies and members which are represented here today are, are central to that. So as we look forward at how we're going to do this, I'm trying to put a conference in Belfast yesterday about integrated care. And someone used a, a, a quote from Henry Ford, who I've heard before forgotten, who said in the context of his uh, development of mass-produced cars, if he asked people back then what they wanted, they were told them they wanted faster horses. And it's a good analogy because we are in Ireland through the discussion that we need to have and through the opportunity that present themselves, presented with uh, an opportunity to redefine healthcare, to move from industrial aid healthcare to digital aid. So we have to open our minds to imagine different ways of doing things, and I'll return to that in a moment. So I have been asked by the organisers to, to, to share data and set the context of where we are presently. And, uh, so, the social care budget for 2014 is set at just over 3 million. It's a shade on the quarter, a small increase on the 2013 position. It includes reductions of 31.3 million. Euro. Those are principally in the pay space and having to move them. So, we've got a fundamental effect the resources available for uh, services. It does include an additional resource of 45 million. 14 million for developments and disability services, and an additional 31 million to cover deficits that existed in services to disability and older people services. In 2013, the data shows that 11,873 people were receiving a home care package compared to 8,990 
2009 to 2007. 9.73 million phone power powers were delivered. 23,000 people were supported in long stay residential care services. And 4.1% of the population, or 21,880 people over the age of 65 years, were supported in the nursing home support scheme or fair deal or stable bed, which is as they're sometimes referred to. And that also occurs in the context of over 21,500 beds in the private and voluntary nursing home sector, accounting for more than 75% of the country's long term care beds. And so I asked to address a particular question about the relationship between the service plan on the home of hours and those actually delivered. Uh, that was because of what we call a ramp up factor. In other words, as you roll out from our hours, you're basically creating a platform for the subsequent year. So you have commitment to get up to a certain run rate, which is quite similar. Some of the strange struggles of having annual service plans to the number of things that have in the Get to a run rate by the end of the year. We can talk about that later. But some of you. That was me, that took me off. And that would be a rare achievement, I'm saying. And not a lot of objective either. Um, so the key initiatives planned for all the people within our health services aim to support improving home care and community to enable older people to live in their own homes completely. That includes continuing to provide the same levels of home care in 14 to 13 plans. We have, somewhat controversially, I admit, allocated 23 million from the nursing home support scheme to increase home care and community supports. And all of that, we're using 10 million to provide new intensive home care packages which will benefit approximately 250 people. I don't know if the size is the presentation. No, <laughs> not worried about this yet. Um, and targeting three million to provide an additional four to five community for community needed care beds. So through these small measures, what we're aiming to do is to give people in our community as much confidence in the stability of services that are and funding of services that are designed to keep them at home that they have in the fairly extreme. Traditionally, over the years, when financial pressures in the health sector had emerged in the year, which they very often had, and they did in particular in 2012, and when the pressure to balance budgets arises, things that are not protected by absolute static are the things that tend to suffer. And consequently, you have the logical consequence of home health powers and home care supports uh, suffering the burden of reductions in expenditure, whereas much more expensive types of care is used to be and you change the psychological approach of the population so people can gravitate to those chemicals that can actually be kept. So the aim here is to create a greater degree of certainty that the health system will no longer do that. That those things that enable people to live where they in many cases prefer to in their own homes and their own communities are secure in terms of the financial support that the health system provides. As the nursing home support scheme. Now, for some reason, this slide that does not correspond to my speaking notes, so I'm going to abandon the slide. Can you do that? This is a uh, very confusing one speaking, looking at slides in front of me that don't correspond to what I'm talking about. And as I and as I was also saying, all, all that attaining resources, 10 million will also be used to maintain the current level of short stay public bed provision, which provides respite rehabilitation step down services using a money policy patient model again to facilitate greater certainty about the ability of families to continue to care in their own homes. And there is a tender process underway that would prove and contact more home care service providers. And the service improvement team of home care and public residential care will be utilised to review the provision of home care in terms of quality, resource allocation, and provide guidance in relation to quality services and its effectiveness to support people at home. So, I've already mentioned the nursing home support scheme. It's a very important part of our care, but because it is so effective and so dependable compared to other services, in our view, it has tended to skew the way people think about the options and the security they can have 
about the type of care that they will receive in the meantime. But it is important that access to the nursing home support scheme is underpinned by a single assessment tool to ensure that communities are uniformly assessed throughout the country and that access is absolutely based on the appropriate judgment that can be made about the right type of care that people should receive in the right setting. Another key uh, fundamental objective of the reforms in the health service is the delivery of integrated care, treating people and service users at the lowest level of complexity that is safe, timely, efficient, and as close to as possible. And the social care division will be working collaboratively across all of our divisions, health and wellbeing, food services, primary care, to ensure that the service user experiences integrated care as they move through the care pathway across both hospital and community services. The National Clinical Programs provide a strong platform to develop and implement standardized models of care and processes. And the older people's model of care will seek the strategic realignment of services for older people with a focus on home care and other community support to avoid hospital admission and support early discharge. A national clinical lead is being appointed to the social care division who will support clinical and professional leadership within the social care management structure, providing the necessary support and advice at national and local level. And social care will also continue with its action plan to maximize compliance with particular standards within available capital funding. I know that's a common challenge across both the public and private sectors. There are a wide range of important strategic approaches across the health services committed to implementing to keep older people well. So between our social care division and the policy division and the Department of Health, we have the national positive aging strategy, the dementia strategy, which is soon to be finalized by the Department of Health, the full prevention program that will involve collaborative work, uh, enhancing all kinds of full prevention strategies, and protecting our future, the report of the working group on our reviews. The National Positive Aging Strategy, which was launched by Minister Lynch last year, is about changing our mindset in how we conceptualize aging and what needs to be done to promote positive aging. The strategy is an overarching blueprint for age-related policy and service delivery. It builds on previous work in the area, and consistent with the Health and Ireland Strategy, asks us to have a whole of society and whole of government approach. And I understand the first conference is scheduled for next week on Thursday. Of April. Keeping older people well in the dementia strategy builds on more recent work, and the health services includes continuing to collaborate and work with the likes of collaborators in the GEO project, which is another innovative approach. And implementing Protecting Our Future to report of the work in the younger abuse also continues to be a priority for us. Awareness and training are key components of the campaign against elder abuse, the Open Your Eyes campaign. And last year's report on elder abuse, founded in 2012, the HSE received 2,460 referrals. And this was an increase of 7% in 2011. Psychological at 30%, and financial abuse at 21%, and self neglect were the most frequently reported causes of referral, with physical abuse accounting for 11%. And this only serves to highlight the need for staff and public awareness to develop services for vulnerable and vulnerable population. Now, I spoke about the opportunities which the upcoming conversation and the opportunities of the new commissioning approach to change fundamentally the way we provide health care to protect ourselves. This is where the reference to the fast reporting comes from. As we look at the health service, we can either simply seek to do everything we're doing now better, or we can seek to do things differently. And this model here shows very forward. We need to move healthcare up towards the top left hand side, <coughs> both from a quality of life perspective. In terms of what our patients and clients would ideally want in the majority of cases. But also in terms of the sustainability of our whole service, we need to fundamentally reshape the way we provide health. So, continuing your conference, 
is absolutely central to the direction of travel within the community within that healthcare service. And in the national conversation that is about to begin, it is important that your voices are raised very strongly to ensure that the incentives for leaders and policies, the way our system is structured, will facilitate that very need. We have an over reliance on acute care and an under reliance on home care. We have legislative and financial processes that promote the most expensive forms of care, which encourage people to believe that they cannot rely on the whole service and maintain them in their own home. And to be fair, there is some evidence over the years that enables that view to be a realistic view. We need to change that view. The health service under the director of this committee to work in with you to go through this process to ensure that that view can be changed. This is something called the Malayan telemedicine model or blueprint. It doesn't just relate to the home care situation, it relates to the whole economy. We need to grasp the opportunities, the, the digital opportunities that present themselves. I'll give you one small example. The National Center for Coagulative Blood Disorders and St. James' Hospital, which is essentially the type of people who can include it has now successfully trialed technology which enables patients who would previously have had to attend the center in order to have their medications and ensure that the right dose, proper tracking of medications and so on, and wherever they live in the country. Now using very simple smartphone technology, the focus storage facilities in their own home, now administer their own medication in a completely safe, controlled and monitored way using modern technology. And this can be applied throughout our system and has particular focus for every aspect of the way we deliver care uh, to those particularly who have multiple uh, health needs and who can be maintained successfully in their own homes. So, in conclusion, aging and the changes we are seeing in our society must always be celebrated as a positive achievement, recognizing that it does bring challenges, particularly in the context of where our whole city presently is. We do have that dual challenge of reducing costs while improving patient outcomes. We often frame this discussion Ireland in the context of the post Celtic era, uh, era uh, downfall, from the time we thought we were in that next few cities. But if we were having this discussion in every other Western European country, we would have the same fundamental pursuit. The current trajectory of costs of provision of healthcare are not sustainable, and yet we have to find a different model. The fact that we are comfortable what we are comfortable and exacerbate and change our starting point, even if we were still in that Celtic era of logical time, we would still have to face the reality that our current model for delivering of healthcare is not sustainable. And therefore, we need to find a new model. Continued demographic pressures and increasing demand of all kinds across the whole spectrum are a part of the discussion we have to have. And as Sarah referenced earlier, that patient safety, client safety must be paramount in all the decisions that we make. We have to hold one truth at all times. For well care costs, and most costs, poor quality care ultimately costs more. In the context of this conference, not having a high quality provision of home care will drive people to be scored for their costs. So we will continue as a health service to provide a home care and clinical supports, continue our drive to integrate the models of care across all services and care groups, working with our workforce, our somewhat diminished workforce, continuing the modernization of the way our workforce is deployed to bring maximum benefit to our population and reforming our services to provide effective, safe, high quality and personal social services. And as we embark on this national conversation, I think it's a real opportunity because in every other major democracy that has had significant improvement in the quality of its health and social care, they always first had a really thorough national conversation about what they want to reinforce it and redefine. Public requirements, 
natural refinements of our ecosystems. We had we had that conversation right, and they implemented it. Just as we did in Texas and other places, we can turn our system around very dramatically. And I hope that you'll have a very successful conference today in Florida. Um, I also hope that the bad weather we started today with the debates of the capital day will be moved for the second time and see some of you have capital and I haven't yet got mine and hopefully you'll have to spend on that as well. And I look forward to hearing um, the benefits of that and for those of you who are watching this on stream, I hope that you will also find the individual way that this conference is being relayed beyond all of this conference and that's informative as well. Thank you very much.
led by the UDC. There is no doubt that the rapid extraction of the program and a half hours and so on, several billion in Europe, have also helped service in recent years to do things in ways that perhaps it wouldn't have done had the trajectory of change been different. Uh, the process we're going through now, the new focus we have, the fact that there is for the first time a social care division, um, and that nationally, it is only defined by the does give us the opportunity to have conversations and make decisions about how that vision can serve the needs of its users better. And the PAC D is very much open to that, that discussion. The national conversation that I refer to should be kicked off, and I think in the coming weeks, the head on the NHIS project, which is designed to stimulate that conversation, will enable us to ask the most fundamental questions about how we want our healthcare system to be in the future. I want to get challenges, and certainly something I'm very conscious of since I've been into this world, is the healthcare system is a large, complex machine which has many things going on at many times. The balance is right between dealing with what's coming at you, while at the same time looking at where you want to go, is a challenge. So, what I want to say to you is I'm not saying we have got to the place that is right, I'm saying we have an opportunity to get there. We mustn't let the challenges that we have today be just the need that we can't get back to. We have to keep our heads high and focus on what we really want and work towards bridging the gap between where we are and where we want to get to. And all too often, um, we look at today's challenge and think that's the reason not to look at what, what we want in the future. That's why I say we talk about uh, aging and demographic pressures on the health system all the time as well as an editor thing. Something we should absolutely celebrate. It is a sign of actually some of the successes of the health service that we have. We need to be now as a backbone health service to deal with those successes.